When you define your life by your position, all right, that's, that's not headed anywhere good. Greatness is not found in position. We are uh, nearing the end of our Choices series, and uh, we've been learning kind of a new theology here. It shouldn't be a new theology because it's a biblical theology. The Bible is uh, teeming with examples of this reality that God holds us responsible for the choices that we make. In fact, the Bible is filled with the stories of people who made good choices and got blessed, who made bad choices and got the consequences of that. And uh, somehow uh, we have allowed a theology to creep into our understanding that makes us think that, well, you know, we're not ultimately responsible and God's in control. And we've decided that we're not going to let the wonderful truth of God's sovereignty eclipse our sense of personal responsibility. You are responsible. God's going to hold you responsible for the choices that you make. So now we come to the last couplet. And we've had uh, authority, uh, identity choices, authority choices, capacity choices, priority choices. Can you guess the last word that governs the last two choices uh, this week and next week? Uh, it deals with something deep inside you, something you may have forgotten about or neglected for a long time. Uh, the last two choices are destiny choices. Your destiny, your destiny has to do with, wh why am I really here? And where's my life going? And at the end of it all, what will I have really accomplished? That's what I got to know. Man, what is my destiny? And I got some good news for you in that regard. Uh, your destiny in terms of the way that God sees you is this, uh, that you were born for greatness. Do you know that? You were born for greatness. And, and, and this is what God made you for when he fashioned you in your mother's womb. Before you ever came into this world, you were born for greatness. Now, I know that when I say something like that, some of you start thinking, see, I told you, honey, I told you he was starting to become like Tony Robbins or something. And, and uh, that's, that's not where I'm coming from at all. Because when I'm done telling you what I think real greatness is, you won't think this is some positive mental attitude pep talk. That's not what I'm going for, okay? I'm not going for some silly horizontal your best life now thing, okay? I'm going for what the Bible says about what real greatness is. And that's why I had you turn to Matthew uh, chapter 20. And why don't you start with this uh, as a starting thought today. Greatness is not found in position. Do you get it? Okay. Real greatness, greatness in God's eyes, lasting greatness, eternal greatness, it's not in, you know, holding some position. Notice Matthew 20, 20. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee, the sons of Zebedee were James and John. Jesus called them in Mark 3, 17, he called them the sons of thunder. These were some seriously fired up guys. In fact, one time uh, when the uh, people who were hearing Jesus, they didn't, they didn't like it and they were rejecting Jesus and uh, Jesus called them the sons of thunder because in uh, Luke 9, 51, they're like, hey Jesus, why don't we just like call down fire from heaven and wipe these guys out? And she's like, no, no, <laughs> we're not going to do that. This was James and John. They were the sons of thunder, um, and uh, they were also part of Jesus' inner circle, along with, who was the other one? Uh, James and John and Peter. I mean, they, these guys were on the inside track. They were with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Just picked three of the disciples. Uh, they were with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, come on, we're going to go pray. And, and so these were his closest friends, Peter, and then these two sons, James and John. Notice verse 20, then the mother of the sons of Zebedee, her name was Salome, actually, and she was really part of the inner circle, too. She was at the crucifixion right there at the base of the cross with Mary. She was uh, with uh, the women who anointed Jesus' body for burial before his resurrection. So this, th these people, they knew Jesus. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up with her two sons and kneeling before him. So they come up to Jesus and they kneel down before him, at least the mother does, and showing great respect... She came before him because she asked him for something. I'm sure a lot of people were asking Jesus for stuff all the time, and, and the Bible shows Jesus as having great patience with people. And just whenever they would, just, it was just so tender and so patient with people. But in this instance, it's interesting because she kneels before him to ask him for something, and he said to her, what do you want? Now, there's a lot of ways to read that, and I'm not trying to uh, put any tonality into it, but there's not a lot of great ways to read that. It's like, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want? And, and, and I'm not just reading into it because a little bit later he says to her in verse 22, he says, you don't even know what you're asking. 
Okay, so he, this, not a great exchange here, but uh, this lady had some moxie, all right, because she comes up to Jesus Christ with her two sons, verse 21, and she said to him, say that these two sons of mine can sit one at your right hand at one at your left in your kingdom. Are you kidding me? Now, now, to sit at your right hand or your left, it's not as big of a deal in our day. Like if you came over to my house sometime and sat at our dining room table, I mean, it wouldn't be that big of a deal where you sat. But in the, in the New Testament times, the person who sat the closest to the head of the table had the most honor. And so they were asking, she was asking, first of all, hey, I don't want my son standing, all right? In this kingdom of yours, Jesus, I want them what? I want them sitting down, all right? They're, they're not going to serve. They're going to be served. And, and I don't just want them anywhere on the team, all right? Um, and I, I, I know it's getting kind of busy here, and pretty soon you're going to have your kingdom and everything, and I just don't want you to lose track of this, Jesus. So if you could just take care of this right now, because I know, notice she says, say it, Jesus, because she knows that if he pronounces it, if he commits to it, she knows it'll happen. So, hey, before things get a little crazy and you get all distracted and stuff, I mean, I know you're busy and everything, but you know how much my sons love you, and if you could just, like, say it right now, that they're going to be, like, right hand, left hand. Like, you could be the CEO, Jesus, but they're like, C-O-O, C-F-O. I want them right there beside you. That's quite a, quite a, no wonder he was like, what do you want? And she said, I want them on the right hand and on the left in your kingdom. And Jesus said, you, you don't even know what you're asking. And isn't that true? In my kingdom, huh? Well, Jesus doesn't even have fully his kingdom yet. Eventually his kingdom's going to be on earth. And of course, he's been exalted to the right hand of God after his resurrection. But we're not in his kingdom yet. I mean, the only kingdom we have is his rule in our hearts. The ultimate kingdom is yet to come. She, did not, she thought it was coming like in the next 10 minutes. And when Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking, he could have said, um, did you know that I'm going to suffer? Did you know that I'm going to be beaten and mocked and spat upon and ridiculed? Do you know that I'm going to be scourged and tortured and paraded through the streets and spat upon and crucified? You want some of that? You don't even know what you're asking. She was like, well, it's just on the right hand and the left. That'd be great. He's like, you don't even know what you're asking. And then he says, are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? Cup, of course, is symbolic of all the suffering of the cross. Jesus suffered in our place so that our sins could be forgiven. That's the good news of the gospel. And, and uh, the cup, remember when Jesus was in the garden, he said, Father, if it's possible, what did he say? Take this, take this cup away from me. And so the cup, Jesus is like, I'm, he knew though, he knew, he even prayed, but he knew, he knew that he was going to drink it right to the bottom. He knew he was going to take all of the punishment for your sin. Think of all the stuff you've done and, and not done. Think of my life and your life. And all of our punishment for all of our sin was placed upon Christ, and it was in that cup. And so, check this out. He's like, are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? Verse 22. They said to him, we are able so apparently at this point they look out from behind their mother's apron and, and, and they're like, this is really kind of a pathetic scene really because mom's doing the asking. It's like, get a life, boys. Uh, you're grown up now. And, and actually there's another account in Mark chapter 10 that has them asking too, so we're not sure whether it happened two times. It wouldn't be surprising if they came back to this theme again or whether the, they were all talking because here at this point, um, apparently all three of them, are you able to drink the cup that I'm able to drink? They said to him, we are able. And that is an outrageous assertion. Can you go through what I'm going to go through? They're like, I can do. I can do. Will do. N not a thing. Not a thing. In. In. All the way in. And, and of course, they had no idea what they were talking about. It's interesting in uh, Matthew 26, 56, when Jesus was arrested, Matthew 26, 56 says, Then all the disciples left him and fled. So humanly speaking, they were not able, they could not. But of course, in, when, in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit comes, um, you're not able to live the Christian life. Do you know that? You're just like the disciples in the Gospels, full of promises and, and not very much follow through. But only because of the Spirit of God within us can we live the Christian life. What they should have said was, on our own, Lord, we are not able. As the Gospel, when they all ran away, they were not on their own able. But of course, later on they would be able. That's why Jesus says to him, they said, we are able, and he said to them, you will drink my cup. In other words, this James right here, he's the one who was beheaded for the gospel in Acts chapter 12. John, the one who's standing there saying, can I be at the right hand? 
He died in exile, the last apostle to die. He died on the Isle of Patmos. He was the author of the book of Revelation. He suffered much for the gospel. And so Jesus looking not to their immediate failure at the cross, but to their ultimate victory in obedience to him. That's why they're like, we're able. And he said, yeah, you will do. You have no idea what you're going to drink. You will drink my cup, notice. But to sit at my right hand and my left, it's not mine to grant. Interesting insight into the Trinity here. The second person of the Trinity could not even grant this. But it is for those to whom it has been prepared by my Father. He's like, God the Father's in charge of that. I can't even make that call by myself. And so really uh, an amazing, amazing thing here. Uh, what they were seeking, of course, was they were seeking a position. They were seeking a, a role. They were seeking a status on his right hand and his left. And of course, what we're learning here, it's interesting to notice that Jesus does not uh, condemn the desire for greatness. He's not like, hey, it's wrong to want to be great. What he's doing is, is restructuring for them an understanding of what greatness really is. You know, you could be the pastor of a church and not in any way be great. You could be the president of a company and not in any way really be great. You could be a politician in high office. You could be a professor at a prestigious college. You can be a pro prominent athlete or a successful entertainer and not in any way be great. Oh, the world might say you're great. People might applaud you and they might line up to shake your hand or get your autograph or some other silly horizontal thing that we all get consumed with. But ultimately, eternally, in God's eyes, you can have position and not be great. That's why Jesus didn't give in to the woman. They wanted something, but they were going about it the wrong way. Greatness is not found in position. If you have gifts, thank God for them. If you have abilities, if you have talents, if you have opportunities that God has given you, thank God for those things and use them for Him to do otherwise. Yeah, not a great use of authority. For additional resources or to request today's message, call 1-800-545-6800 or go to jamesmcdonald.tv. Now stay with us. There's much more teaching ahead from James McDonald here on Walk in the Word. The last few weeks we've been going through this 10 choices teaching and we know it's changing lives, praise God, because we've heard from you. We made this Bible study to help you dig deeper into each choice. You know, we're all created with the ability to choose. And you know, good choices bring hope, good choices bring joy, and good choices bring freedom. 10 choices to change my life literally changed my life. When James preached that message in our church, I knew that he was talking to me. It felt like he was preaching directly to me. I just cried and cried and cried. And the Lord made it very clear to me that I needed to make a choice, that it was my choice to do what the Lord said to do and let him be my final authority and me not be my authority. That's where I experienced the most freedom. The 10 Choices Bible study is about the transformation God has proven he can bring when you follow his prescription for life. If you're feeling powerless, if you feel like you're stuck, let me remind you that God has given you the ability to make a choice. Get the study in your hands, open your Bible, and allow God to guide you through 10 of the most crucial choices that you can make. And you can also order the 10 CD set as a companion to the written study. Dig deep into God's Word with Pastor James and discover the hope and joy that come from making better choices. Call 800-545-6800 or go to jamesmcdonald.tv right now. How many people here ever lost a position? Or here's a good one, truth, truth in church. How many people here have ever been fired from a job? Put up your hand if you have ever been fired. Come on, come on, don't be embarrassed. Let other people see. I'm gonna tell you my story in a second. How many people have ever been fired from a job? I've been fired before, not recently, thank God. <laughs> and and uh, though I haven't checked my email, so I better be on my best behavior here. But um, yeah, uh, when I was in college, uh, one time I had to drop out of college because I didn't have enough money to go back to Bible school, so I took a, a semester and I, I worked at this company called Mutual Wholesale Stationery. It was a, a, a sort of a, the office type thing. And, and I was back in the warehouse, you know, just putting things on shelves and, and doing all of that. And, and, uh, but I was so fired up about the Lord, I kept sharing my faith with people. So the boss called me and he's like, you can't, you can't do that here, you just need to like do your job. And uh, so I, oh, no way, man, and I wouldn't stop, so I just kept sharing my faith. And then he just called me and said, yeah, you're fired. Because we told you, and it's funny, back then I kind of looked at it as, oh, I'm being persecuted, you know, because I was sharing my faith. Now looking back, I'm like, no, I probably just should have done my job. <laughs> 
And uh, so I got fired for that. And then another time uh, in college, I was working as a security guard. Now that's funny by itself, <laughs> all right? I was working as a security guard, and Kathy had gone uh, to another part of Canada to go to one year of Bible college, and I was really missing her, and it was a pretty serious thing by now, and I was thinking about all these guys at that college, and I was probably a little insecure about all that, so I had to call her on the phone. We were having kind of an argument on the phone, and it was late at night. I had to make this, the rounds in a factory that was completely closed, and so, uh, you know, I was doing my rounds and everything, but in between, I was talking to her on the phone, and the boss shows up. He pulls up, and he's like, hey, I need to talk to you for a second. And I was like, yeah, just a second, I'm on the phone with my girlfriend. <laughs> He says, no, 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 I need to talk to you right now. I said, yeah, no problem, just a second, I'm on the phone with my girlfriend. He's like, no, no, I need to talk to you right now. I was like, well, just a second, I'm on the phone with my girlfriend. So he got in his car and left. And then they called me in the next day and said, you're fired. <laughs> you're fired. So, <laughs> so, so um, yeah, again, my fault, not great. But I really remember both times very distinctly a sense of loss. Like, now i got to go tell my family. I, got, I lost my position. I, I mean, I lost it. And, of course, those are silly college jobs and not really very hard to talk about. But some of you know what it's like to work for a long time to have something and then to lose it. Maybe you lost your position in a family against your will. Maybe you lost your position in a company against your will. Maybe you lost your position in an organization or in a school against your will. And maybe even unjustly so. And, and the greater the injustice, of course, the greater the, the, the wounding and the difficulty of that. And, and, but listen, but, but to come inevitably to this reality, greatness is not in position. I am not my job. I am not my role. And, you know, you see uh, parents, mothers especially, struggling with, you know, the kids grow up, they, uh, they go to college, who am I now? I don't have my kids. They're not in the house anymore. And, and when you define your life by your position, all right, that's, that's not headed anywhere good. Greatness is not found in position. This lady, she wanted something for her sons, but, but she couldn't have been more wrong. What God was looking for, what Jesus was looking for in those two disciples had nothing to do with where they sat at the table. Do you get it? Greatness is not found in position. And here's the second thing. Uh, we'll continue through Matthew 20. Uh, greatness is not found in power. When, when God looks at you, he's not like impressed. He's, he's kind of got the power thing cornered, if you know what I mean. So he's not looking at you and going, wow, no, you, 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 you. You are a powerful man, okay? Yeah, that's not what God's looking for. And God's not impressed with power. He, he's not, um, well, just look what happens in the text. Matthew uh, 20, verse uh, 24. And when the 10 heard it, oh, yeah, that's right, there was those other disciples. I guess they were standing there when that mom was making her pitch. Now imagine, have you ever played on a basketball team? Can you imagine if you went by the coach's office and you heard two guys in there going, I don't think he should be the captain anymore. I want to be the captain. You imagine how that make you feel? Or if you drop by your boss's office to, to, to leave something there and you couldn't help but noticing on the desk was a letter to the boss from one of your coworkers saying that you should be the new boss, how would that make you feel? Like, I think he should make that decision. And how come he, and that's why it says in the text, notice, and when the 10 heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. The New King James says they were greatly displeased. Um, well, what that means is that that's the best word that you can use that's edifying. I'm going to say that they probably had some, they were severely ticked, okay? And they probably said some other things, but the Bible, the writers of Scripture, the Holy Spirit just chose to edit that part out, okay? Yeah, we'll just leave that to your imagination. How many people think they probably had a couple things to say? Yeah, not great. They, they, were, they were severely uh, distressed. They were indignant at the two brothers. Man, who do you think you are? And, 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 and where do you get off? And, and, and I don't know who you think you're trying to... And, yeah, upset. When the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. And Jesus noticed he's so tender. Jesus called them to him. He's like, okay, guys, guys, huddle up, okay? First of all, you two and your mom... <laughs> You don't get it, okay? And then you guys, like seriously, like they're just, they're just let it go. It's okay. And he kind of, okay, everybody, huddle up here. And, and some pretty great teaching comes out right now. He, then he, then uh, when Jesus called them to him, he said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And what that means is, is that the, he's talking about the rulers of the Gentiles. He's talking about unbelievers. He's like, you know how it goes in the marketplace, don't you? You know how it works at the, at the uh, local uh, 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 
library. You know how it works at the university. You know how it works over at the high school. You know what those parents are like, those soccer moms. You, <laughs> you know how the authority thing works out there, how people try to kiss up to the boss or kiss up to the coach so their kid will get more playing time or try to cut the corners or get a deal or do something on the side. Do you know how it works out there? Go like this if you know how it works out there. She's like, okay, do you know how it works out there, how people use authority and how they, they skim and how they cut the corners and how they, they try to get, get a break? And, and he said, notice, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise, see there it is, it's, it is all about greatness, true greatness. Their great ones, in quotations, exercise authority. The word authority there actually is the idea of to tyrannize. They, they tyrannize people. And I mean, is that not true in our world today? How anybody who just gets a little bit of authority is so dangerous. Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay? And I'm not talking about people who really have authority and struggle to use it properly. Uh, for example, there was a big thing on YouTube this week about a police officer who pulled out his taser gun and, and took somebody down and, and, and uh, maybe shouldn't have. Well, just so you can hear it from me, I have so much sympathy for these police officers. I mean, I mean, the kind of pressure they're under, and they're, they're putting their life on the line every day, and they don't know what's in the next car that they're walking up to. And I'm not excusing anything, not at all, but I'm just saying, I mean, it's not easy to do what they do. I, th I think the people who are out of control with their authority are sometimes the people that have the least authority. You know, like the security guard at the library. Watch out for that guy, okay? <laughs> Or, or, I mean, the, the president of the condo association, authority tripping, I'm telling you. And do and you know what I'm talking about? Anybody gets a little bit of authority, man, they just can't wait to read the riot act. And, and it's just so foolishness. And, and so what Jesus is saying is, is um, that's the way it is with the non-believers. That's the way it is in the world. That's what we have to deal with every day. It's not supposed to be like that in God's family. And it's easy to poke fun at other people who don't use their authority well. What's a little harder is to look in the mirror and see how we're handling the authority that God's given to us, where we work and in our home and uh, in our church. So let's listen to this for a minute. I know I'm abusing my authority when. Okay? I know I'm abusing my authority when. Here's five things. Here's the first one. I know I'm abusing my authority when... I keep reminding people of my title and my position, all right? Watch out for that, okay? Watch out for the, you know, don't, don't, don't you know who I am? I'm your, I'm your boss. If you have to keep telling people you're the boss, you might, you might not be for very long, okay? It, it, it's, it doesn't work like that. If you have to keep saying, you know, I might, and your title, and, and I'm this, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm your pastor, and, and then if you, if you always call it, want people to call you by your title, or if you get offended if someone addresses you or puts in writing but doesn't have your title, I'm Dr. So-and-so, I'm this and so, and, uh, you know, I absolutely refuse for people to call uh, me reverend. I, an elder early in our church made a great statement to me I've never forgotten, and he said, only Jesus is reverend. Only Jesus is to be revered. The rest of us are just regular people trying to serve God, and, and uh, it's not wrong to call someone by a title, and I never correct someone if that's meaningful to them. But if you want that, if you desire that, yeah, you might not be doing a great job with your authority. Here's another one. I know I'm abusing my authority when I expect or demand privilege. When I expect or demand privilege. And uh, I, I have to have a special parking place. I have to have a special treatment. I have to have a special by, by, because of my position. And, and uh, when you expect or worse, demand special treatment, that's, that's, that's not great. And, uh, oh, here's one. I know I'm abusing my authority when I become comfortable with personal praise. You know, when, when uh, you know, it's not wrong for people to thank you. It's not wrong for people to appreciate you. It's not wrong for people to say, you know, I really just want to thank you. But the problem is, is that when someone is doing that and, and you're thinking to yourself, yeah, I really am amazing. <laughs> okay? Wow, they finally figured it out. This is a good day for you. You know who I am. Awesome. N not great. Not great. Not great in God's eyes. All right? there, all, there should always be something that makes you a little uncomfortable when people want to thank you or put the focus of the attention on you. I remember when I, I didn't see this coming, but when I uh, started to write some books, people, and I still don't really get this, I've never done this, people always come up to you, they want you to sign their book. You know, and, and uh, never really been comfortable with that. 
Of course, you don't want to make a bigger scene about it because then they're like, oh, you're too good to sign my book. I just can't get out of this hallway. There's no doors. You know, and, and so what I decided to do is, every time I have to do something like that, I always write the little scripture reference underneath, 2 Corinthians 4, 7, which says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And, and just put little, if you have an authority, if you have a position, if you have uh, a situation where people are prone to thank you and appreciate for what you do at work, or just always deflect uh, reasonably the thank the person and then just thank the Lord. Because all that we have, of course, the scripture says, what do you have that you did not receive? And if you've received it, why would you boast as though you have not received it? If you have gifts, thank God for them. If you have abilities, if you have talents, if you have opportunities that God has given you, thank God for those things and use them for him. To do otherwise, yeah, not a great use of authority. If you're thinking, how did I end up here? My life isn't what I wanted it to be then it's time for a change. The 10 Choices Bible Study is about the transformation God has proven He can bring when you follow His prescription for life. This study can be yours for your gift of any amount to walk in the Word. If you fear that nothing can turn your life around, if you're ready to make choices that bring help and hope to you and those you love, get this study in your hands, open your Bible, and allow God to guide you through 10 of the most crucial choices you can make. And to make your personal study even richer, call right now with your gift of $90 or more and order the 10 CD teaching set as a companion to the written study guide. Choose now to exert some focused attention, followed by deliberate action, and you will quickly reap the benefits of better choices. Begin your journey to better choices. Call 800-545-6800 or go to jamesmcdonald.tv right now. Hey, we're not getting around about these resources, okay? So if you're uh, watching Christian television every day, all day, but you never order anything, you don't get the tools to help you go from hearing to doing the Word, you're really missing out on a lot. So call us, get the resource, and let's go forward and grow together. This program was paid for by the friends and partners of Walk in the Word. And you know, good choices bring hope. Good choices bring joy. And good choices bring freedom. I needed to make a choice, that it was my choice to do what the Lord said to do and let Him be my final authority and me not be my authority. That's where I experienced the most freedom. The 10 Choices Bible Study is about the transformation God has proven He can bring when you follow His prescription for life. If you're feeling powerless, if you feel like you're stuck, let me remind you that God has given you the ability to make a choice. Get the study in your hands, open your Bible, and allow God to guide you through 10 of the most crucial choices that you can make. And you can also order the 10 CD set as a companion to the written study. Dig deep into God's Word with Pastor James and discover the hope and joy that come from making better choices. Call 800-545-6800 or go to jamesmcdonald.tv right now.